thanks very much. Let's just pray as we come to this beginning of this story. Father, we, we thank you that uh, you are the Almighty God. We've been acknowledging that already today. We've been singing words about your power, but also about your compassion and your love and your mercy. And so we pray that as we start this book of Jonah and as we look at chapter one now, we, we ask that you be teaching us the deep truths that are contained in it, that we would hear your voice speaking to us and that by faith in Jesus Christ, we would respond and you would open life up for us. You would create a new way. You might develop our understanding of you. You might grow our faith. You might move us forward. Uh, Lord, that's your desire, to keep us from wandering or running. You want us to come to you and to experience life in all its fullness. So please show us, please teach us today and work in our lives by your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, if you open up a children's Bible, what are you likely to find in it? What, what are, the, what are the, the main things that you're going to find in a children's Bible? Well, okay, let's flick to the New Testament. The New Testament, you're going to find the stories of Jesus, right? You're going to find stories of Jesus' power, Various miracles, feeding of the 5,000 is likely to be in there, isn't it? Because of the drama and the, the amazing ability of Jesus to, to multiply the food. Let's see other stories in there of Jesus' compassion and, and healing of sick people. Jesus drawing alongside and caring for those um, who really needed him. You're going to see naturally the, the, the pinnacle of Jesus' mission to earth as Jesus died on the cross as Jesus rose again to beat death. It's what you're likely to find in the children's Bible, in the New Testament. But then when we go back to the Old Testament, what is likely to be in there? Well, absolutely, you're going to have the story of Adam and Eve and the creation of the world, how everything began. But you're also then going to see stories, uh, dramatic stories of God's intervention in people's lives. You're going to see uh, Noah's Ark. Often the front of a children's Bible is, is, is a toss-up between the creation story or Noah's Ark, isn't it? But what else? You, you, you may well have the story of the Exodus, God freeing his people from slavery. Uh, you're going to find Daniel in the lion's den. And almost certainly you're going to have Jonah and the big fish. The most vis visually dramatic stories are the stories that you're likely to find in the children's Bible, right? Uh, the pictures, the, the, the sort of the pace of the stories themselves, and, of course, it, the stories that capture children's imagination. They're the things. In the shorter Bibles, what gets included are these sorts of things. But the problem is, is that as we grow older, or what, what can often happen is we can intellectualize our faith. So much that stories like Jonah can be relegated to simply the children's Bible in our focus. Why? Because we're uncomfortable. We're uncomfortable with stories like Jonah because we have to decide, it's hard for us to decide whether these, the events in these stories really happened. And what can, what can sort of happen is that a story like Jonah can become more like a fairy story to us rather than a real-life lesson. You seen that happen maybe in your own understanding? Why Jonah doesn't often get a look into us as adults? Uh, because running away from God and being, being swallowed by a big fish cannot be explained very easily, can it? So what happens is uh, we, um, we think, well, it's good to read to the children because the children, younger children, are not going to ask us the difficult questions that we don't want to answer. How can a man be in a fish for three days and be spat out again? can't answer that easily. So it's easier to, to read it to children but ignore it as adults. The problem is, of course, is that there are so many miraculous stories in the Bible that if we literally took out every story that we couldn't explain that God has done by his intervention in people's lives, we would literally have thread, uh, shreds left, wouldn't we? <laughs> couldn't hold up your Bible without it just being dangling. There'd been hardly anything left. So we can't can't do that. And if we neglect this story as, as adults, 
then we miss being confronted with the very issues that God has for us that he really wants us to learn. Things like running away from God. In what ways do we do that? And what does that show about our hearts? Our sin catching up with us when we try and hide those things and think we can get away with it. Um, God meeting us in the depths of our despair by his great mercy on our lives. God giving us second chances in life to serve him and, and seeing that he can use even poor people like us for his glory. Uh, and then even at the end, our resentment. Our resentment against God for his compassion on people that we don't think deserve it. Wow, these are the things that the story of Jonah brings up for us. We cannot neglect or ignore this story uh, because God has so much to say to us. So we're going to spend four weeks, four weeks in this amazing and challenging story to see what God was doing in and through Jonah's life and what he really wants to say to us. And so here we are today, running from the Almighty. I've got three questions. I've got like a, a why What's, our, what's my point? So why, a, a, a what, and a how, isn't it? Let me have a look now. I've forgotten where I am. Yeah, why, a how, and a what. Okay, big questions uh, for us in this story. The first one is, why do we run from God? See, the story of Jonah starts pretty abruptly. It just says in verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. So we're straight into the what happened in the story, but it's worth pausing just for a few minutes to set one thing straight before we rush on too quickly uh, about the historicity of this story, okay? The fact that this is a real person in a real situation, these are real events happening. There's a massive clue right in verse 1 to, 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 to tell us that God wants us to know this is a real thing going on here. See, in the Bible, you get different genres, different types of writing style. But you get visions. You get visions in the Bible, don't you? And visions paint spiritual pictures. You get parables. And parables give godly insights. But there's only one parable in the Bible that Jesus spoke that actually names a person in the story. Remember which one it was? The rich man and Lazarus. And the reason why Jesus used the name of, of Lazarus, the poor man, you know, the story of the poor man Lazarus who ends up going to heaven and the rich man who, who relied on his money and his wealth, he ended up in hell, uh, is because of what the name Lazarus meant. Jesus was emphasizing a point. Lazarus was a, 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 a derivation, of, it's a Greek variant of the word or the name Eleazar. Jewish name, which means God is my help. So Lazarus, the poor beggar, knew that God was his help and that he had everything he needed because God was on his side. So Jesus used that name for a purpose. But then we see that in this story, our main character is named. And not just him, but his father is named. We know that the main character is Jonah and his, son, his father is called Amittai. And so God is pointing us towards the fact that this is a real person. In fact, Jonah in the Old Testament is mentioned one, one other time um, in uh, 2 Kings, uh, 2 Kings 14. And it says that Jonah was a prophet from a place called gath Hepha, in the territory of the promised land given to the tribe of Zebulun. When God's people entered the promised land, the book of Joshua tells us that, that that's where uh, the place was. So, so Jonah was from that place. And in that particular reference in 2 Kings, Jonah announced the good news that some of the territories of Israel will be restored under King Jeroboam. So it's really interesting that Jonah's two places in the Old Testament, the one in 2 Kings, he's got a really positive message to share. Uh, some news is easier to share, isn't it, than others? <laughs> But the biggest place we find is Jonah, the book of Jonah itself. Much harder news to share, which we're going to focus on here. Um, so even just those couple of references in the Old Testament can place Jonah's life at about 800 years before Jesus came into the world. Historical person, real situations. And Jesus himself talks about Jonah. He references Jonah too. Um, when Jesus is answering um, some of the points that the teachers of the law bring to him, the teachers of the law come and say, Jesus, give us a sign. They're continually wanting to see signs from Jesus to prove who he was and show his, 
his, his identity and his power. And Jesus responds and says that he would only give them the sign of Jonah. What's, he, what's Jesus saying there? He's saying that as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and to three nights, so, Jesus said, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so if Jesus is wanting us to believe that he really did, truly, in the flesh, he was going to die physically for our sins and to rise again to eternal life, if Jesus was really going to do that, then by making the link to Jonah, surely he's implying that the stories in the events of the book of Jonah really happened too. Jesus believed it. And so he's wanting us to believe it. And if the Ninevites, as we come on to see later in the book, if the Ninevites, the city of Nineveh, the evil and all the stuff that was going on, if they repented at Jonah's message and God spared their lives, then Jesus said about himself that someone greater than Jonah is here. That's what Jesus said. Someone greater, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus was saying, through God, through me, God's plan is to save the world. Not just to save one nation or a group of people. God's plan is to save anyone across the whole world who would believe. This is the power of God shown through Jesus, the one who is greater than Jonah. So Jonah's a real person. These are real events. We're introduced to Jonah the man in verse 1, but then we're now seeing Jonah's mission. Uh, have a look at verse 2 as the story con continues. God says to Jonah, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So there we go. The favorable message of two, two kings is now Jonah has the opposite. He's to preach against a nation's sin. What did he do? Verse 3 tells us Jonah's response. Jonah ran away. He headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port, and after paying the fare, he went aboard, sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. He ran away. Now, why did Jonah run? Um, was he scared? Was he scared to... to to challenge the Ninevites and potentially receive a negative response. Sometimes that's us, isn't it? Sometimes we're so reluctant to, to talk about sin because we're worried. We're worried about how it might be received. We, we think you know, people are going to judge us or they're, they're going to reject us. We don't want to be rejected, do we? We want to be liked. We want to be accepted by people. And as soon as we, we bring something negative or seemingly negative, we think... You know, it's going to go badly for us. But it's interesting that that's not actually what was going on for Jonah. Uh, it's interesting to find that Jonah ran away from God's command for precisely the opposite reason. It's the opposite reason. In chapter 4, in what should have been a happy ending, and Rob's going to preach on this in a few weeks' time, Jonah actually contests. And he says this to God. He says, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Because Jonah knew that full well that if he preached the gospel message of sin and repentance to the Ninevites, he knew full well that it was quite possible many of them would actually turn to the Lord. And guess what? He didn't want it. He didn't want it. You think of Jonah and what he thought about the Ninevites. He's like, I cannot have them doing that. These terrible people. They're wicked people. How do they deserve God's love? So I'm not doing it. That's why Jonah ran away. And God firstly uses the story of Jonah to shout out to the nation of Israel. First and foremost, where this story is set in the Old Testament, it's a message to Israel themselves, to the nation. You see, in becoming God's treasured possession, as God rescued um, Israel and his people from slavery and, and called them to himself, a treasured people, he gave them a mission. 
They were in, to, to enjoy the blessings of God's love and all that he had for them. But they were also, as prophesied by, um, by Isaiah, to be a light for the world. Isaiah says this, I, it's God, from God to, to his people, I will make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So they were to spread the news of God's goodness so that many other people could enjoy what they had. But largely, the Jews failed in their mission. Um, there were occasions, of course, where individuals or small numbers of people came to join the Israelites and the Jewish nation in worshipping the true God. But in the main, uh, they, the, the Israelites were disinterested in sharing the news of God and the offer of coming to him. And so Jonah, the story of Jonah, was actually a warning it was a warning to Israel to wake up. Your purpose in life is not to get comfortable and just to enjoy me for yourselves, but to share me so that anyone can have the chance to know me for themselves. So that's firstly what Jonah was written for. But we now, as we sit in the, the post-cross and resurrection time, this, this new era, um, this story of Jonah has many, many ways of speaking to us. It's a picture of our lives too. It's a picture of how we might run from God in many, many ways. In what ways do we run from God, or people run from God? Well, the first way is to, just to refuse that God exists at all. Many people run away from God by ignoring him and, and getting on with their lives and either trying to content themselves with what they have or, or simply... Um, trying to fix problems for themselves. Do you remember last week as we concluded our series in Proverbs where this, this man, Agur, asked the right questions of life? When he realized that he'd fallen short, when he realized that he couldn't have all the answers, he cried out to the one who did. And the Psalms, David in the Psalms, Psalm 14, says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And anyone that uh, uh, refuses to acknowledge that God exists is running running from the truth and running from the way that they'll find all that their existence is meant to be. But there are also ways that we might run, even if we are Christians. We can run away by not believing that God's way is best for us. I'm sure, you know, as you pray, and maybe you keep in touch with people that used to come to this church, people that called themselves Christians but are not with us now, not worshipping God with us. And we, we often talk about people drifting away, don't we? Backsliding, because in our eyes, we, we see it as a gradual thing. Often it seems to be a gradual thing. But I would suggest that when we think about the book of Jonah, spiritually, they're not just drifting, they're running. They're running because um, actually there's a lure of something else where people turn towards other things that they think are better, more fulfilling, more satisfying, or have the answers that, that they refuse to believe God has, not believing God's way is best. So it may be anything like the world's offer of success or entertainment or certain relationships or addiction. There's a running away from God and running towards something else. Um, or perhaps uh, uh, there are some people that are not necessarily saying that God is not in their minds now. And people, people not coming to our church but might say, yeah, I'm still a Christian. Still trusting. But there is a, a running away from uh, the, 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 the belief that actually being together as Christians and church is a really important thing get people, don't we? I'm sure you know people that say, I can be a Christian and not go to church. But there's no, there's no language for that in the Bible, in the New Testament. There's no language for that at all. It talks about being part of God's people. It talks about the beauty of the church and our differences and our, um, our, our you know, all, all of the color of uh, the diversity of God's people is there to complement what God has done and the grace in our lives. And the, the hard work of maintaining unity and building relationships is part of the glory of God to show his power at work by his spirit in what he can do amongst us. And so those people that are running away from God and his people 
is still a refusal to believe that God's way is best. The church is a good thing. It's a great thing. Even when we fail as God's people, he's got a work to do in us. But here's a message for us who are in church week after week. Before we comfort ourselves by thinking, well, I'm okay, I don't fit into either of those two categories, there are, there are ways that we might still be running away from God even if we sit week by week, we listen to the Bible, and yet the words disappear as soon as we hear them. We just had two months thinking about God's wise way for living now through the book of Proverbs. And I wonder which things maybe as you heard them initially challenged you and you thought there's maybe something for me in that and yet you haven't really done anything about that because it just disappeared and life got on top of you or you got busy. Um, and it wasn't important enough. It's not been important enough to face it and to think actually God's way is best for me. And so in some areas of our lives, we can be a bit of a contradiction, can't we? We say, I, I love God, but actually we're running from him in certain ways. There's certain aspects of our lives we're running. Um, so our religious habits actually stop us from listening to God. We think we're doing well because we come to church, but we're still running from God in some ways. But very specifically from the book of Jonah, we can run from God in terms of our mission to reach the lost. That was Jonah, wasn't it? Jonah said, these people don't deserve God. I'm not going to them. We categorize people and we say, some are worthy and some aren't. How true that might be for us, eh? Get comfortable. We might get comfortable with our privileges of being in God's family. Or we get callous in our hardness towards people we don't think deserve it. Um, and we get too cautious because we don't step out into situations where God might actually show his power. And we limit that because we don't really want to listen or obey him. So you think back to Isaiah the prophet. You know, his famous response to God's call was, here I am, send me. And you contrast it with Jonah who said, no, not me, Lord. Complete opposite. But this is where we fix our eyes on Jesus and we say, oh, how thankful. I don't know about you, but how thankful are you, I am, that Jesus obeyed God's call to come. Jesus fulfilled every prophecy about him, himself, that was written about him to come and be the saviour of the world. So much so that in Hebrews 10, Jesus is quoted as to say, here I am, it's written about me in the scroll, I've come to do your will, my God. Jesus came and died on the cross for us. Gave up, gave up the glory of heaven to obey his Father and come to all those who didn't deserve it. That's you and me. None of us deserve God's love, and yet he shared it through Christ. Where would we be without Jesus' obedience? So running away, eh? That's the first three verses, and it's a challenge to us already, isn't it? It's not, a, not, children, not just a children's story. This is it. But as we carry on, the, the next question is, how does God catch our attention when we're running? You see, the worst thing that can happen when we're going off track in our lives, the, the, the very worst thing that can happen is that things go smoothly. Not for us when we're in it, yeah, because we might be, uh, I don't know, we, we might make a poor choice, but we're enjoying it. And uh, we don't realise the harm we're actually doing to ourselves or other people. Uh, maybe we, we're actually succeeding, or we think we're succeeding in some way. We're making money, or we're gaining some popularity, and in fact, we're missing what's actually of true value in life. Um, what about if we're so consumed with the direction of our life, we're so focused on something that we actually ignore the voices of reason. Um, we're blinkered. We think we're right. And that's it. I'm carrying on. And the, uh, the scary thing in, 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 in the Bible, in Romans chapter 1, Paul the Apostle talks about how sometimes, you know, he, he contrasts, he sort of contrasts the way that we can exchange the truth of God's way for lies and live in ways that are completely contradictory. But the scary thing is that sometimes God actually hands people over to their desires. So that in our sin, in people's sin, um, we can be handed over to them and actually those things that we think 
we think are great, we're enjoying it, and, and actually those, those are the things that are actually destroying us. And so much of the time people don't even realize it. They're handed over to those things. And they don't even realize. But here's the great news in the book of Jonah. The great news for Jonah himself is that God did not give up on him. As Jonah was running away, the worst thing that could have happened is that life would have gone really well for him. But God did not want that to happen because God had better. And when things sometimes seem to crash around us, and it's not true for every trouble we go through, yeah, let's not equate every trial or trouble as to, to be our fault, but sometimes when we suffer or we go through a storm, it's because God is doing something to make us listen. He wants to catch our attention because he's got something better for us. And so what happens in this story in verse 4, it says that the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose on the ship that it thre threatened to break it up. Now, of course, one of the things here, as we, we talked about God's sovereignty, his, his almighty power, is that you can't get away with it with God. That's the first thing about Jonah's life. Jonah was running away, but he wouldn't get away with it. God's still in charge. Jonah wasn't in charge. God was. But the great thing was that God had a plan to get Jonah's attention, and he wasn't giving up on him. He had a greater purpose. The hardened sailors, of course, were scared. They cried out to their local gods. They were prepared to cut their losses to try and save their lives, throwing everything overboard to try and lighten the ship. But where was Jonah? This is a strange one, isn't it? Jonah was below deck. He fell asleep in a deep sleep, a deep sleep in a huge storm. How on earth is this possible? Um, Jesus, we remember the story, don't we, of Jesus uh, being on a boat in a storm, and he was sound asleep. Now, the reason that Jesus was asleep in the storm was because he was completely in control of it. And as he stood up, we saw his power. He knew what he was doing, but that wasn't the case with Jonah, surely. No, it wasn't. So maybe Jonah was asleep because his running from God actually exhausted him. He was on the ship, and he was so tired that he fell asleep. Or maybe, scaringly, scarily at this moment anyway, his heart was so hardened and his conscience was so dull that he could even sleep when things were going against him, going against his running away. We don't know. But in their desperation to find a God, any God, anyone who had control over this storm, the, the sailors woke Jonah up. They, they urged him. They said, get up, call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we won't perish. And in their determination to, to find a solution, they, they cast lots. A bit of a mysterious thing for us now, but it was either a pulling out of some sticks, so the short stick, we get this phrase, don't we? Pulling the short straw, yeah? Um, the shortest stick. Or maybe they rolled some dices and the lowest number was the person that was identified. Um, not something that we're called really to do now. Uh, we've got the whole of Scripture. But they were convinced, these guys were convinced that the outcome showed that Jonah was responsible. And suddenly, they were really interested in him. His background, who he was, where he was from, what was going on. And Jonah answered. He said, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now, that's Jonah's declaration of his beliefs. Uh, but isn't it amazing how incredibly inconsistent we can be sometimes in our lives? Particularly when we sin. Um, Jonah claimed to worship the Lord, and he knew full well, as that verse that we focused on earlier in the service, he knew full well that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Jonah's just said that. He said, I worship the God who's made everything. He's in charge of all things, he has all power, he knows everything. Um, and yet Jonah was still running away. Isn't it amazing how we do that sometimes? We we proclaim our worship and our praise for Jesus with our voices. We've even done that this morning so far. And yet we've already said and identified the fact that we can still be running from God in some ways. We're inconsistent, aren't we? And God has got some things maybe to highlight in us today as we reflect on this, this chapter. As to where, are our, where are our inconsistencies? Where does God want to work on some things to help us to trust him more in our lives? Um, and as we think about this storm 
that God sent to Jonah to catch his attention. I wonder for you, has God sent a storm in your life for a particular thing, for, for, for a purpose maybe? You didn't necessarily realize why. But were you grateful? Were you grateful in the end that God did it? Were you grateful that he hasn't left you alone? But he's done something because he had a purpose for your life to bring you back. The Bible tells us that God disciplines his children. Not to punish us anymore. Because if we trust in Jesus, then Jesus died for our, for our punishment. But he disciplines us to purify us and to make us more holy. That's what God is often doing, isn't he? He doesn't want us to live comfortably in our sin, but he wants to purify us. And isn't it a fantastic parable? That parable of the lost sheep, the hundred sheep. Jesus' parable there shows us that the shepherd was not content with the 99. He loved the 99, but he wasn't content with the 99, but he cared about the one that wandered. And he was prepared to do whatever it took to find the one and to bring them back. That's what Jesus is like with us when we wander, when we run. He loves us so much that he's prepared to do whatever and to bring us home. So I wonder what that looks like for you and for me today. Um, and I wonder who, who else do you know who's running from God at the moment? What's your prayer for them? What do you really want for their lives? How might God catch their attention? And how might you be there for them to point them back to God? Well, the last part of today is thinking about what is God's good purpose for us in our lives. This is the what. And the storm was getting worse and worse. Um, it was clear that Jonah was responsible uh, for the storm. And the sailors asked Jonah, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? And Jonah, Jonah suddenly had some answers. Jonah said, pick me up and throw me into the sea. It'll become calm. I, I know that it's my fault that the great storm has come upon you. And this was the first step for Jonah. This was an acknowledgement of his own sin. Um, he was confessing that it was his sin that had created the mess. Do you remember the... Um, the, the thief on the cross next to Jesus. You had the two thieves, didn't you? Either side of Jesus on the cross and, and the debate between them as they hung there. And, and, and one of the thieves said, he said, we are being punished justly and we're getting what our, what our deeds deserve. He was confessing, publicly confessing his sin and the fact that he needed to be judged for his sin. In both cases, both Jonah and the thief, they... they took responsibility for their sin publicly. Um, it's the first and the hardest step, always, to acknowledge that, it's, that we're in the wrong. I find it hard, do you? To admit that it's your fault. But I wonder what that looks like for us as a church. Because Jonah's there actually saying, it's my fault that this mess has been created. I wonder how we're doing with that and, and how readily we admit that our mistakes cause an effect for others. You know, rarely do we sin in isolation. Often there's a consequence, isn't there? And, and often relationally, you know, we, we can spoil our relationships between each other. And what would it be like for us as a church if we were more open and, and more quick to acknowledge our own faults and are taking responsibility for our sins, how transformational that might be in our relationships here. How quick we might be to, to bring restoration to fallouts, how much more unity we would have, um, how much more we would call upon God's grace and his mercy upon us. Let's pray about that. Uh, and let's have the courage to admit our failures. Sin has consequences, doesn't it, for ourselves and not, not just uh, for ourselves, but for others. And so Jonah's sin, as it caused others to suffer, he instructed the sailors to throw him overboard. They, they at first, of course, resisted. They didn't want to be responsible for his death. But finally, after looking for alternatives, they did it. And verse 15 is a great picture. It's a real event, of course. We've said that already. They took Jonah, they threw him overboard, 
And what happened? Verse 15 says, the raging sea grew calm. When we think about God's purposes for our lives, that verse, verse 15, is a powerful and a wonderful picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are some differences, of course. In the story of Jonah, the guilty man was sacrificed to save the lives of the innocent. But in the case of Jesus Christ, the one innocent man died to save all of the guilty. Back to Isaiah the prophet again, who contrasts this. He says about Jesus, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. Can you see it? Jesus, the innocent one, died in my place, the guilty one. And for all of those who believed. What a picture of the gospel this is in verse 15. That as one person was sacrificed... The sea grew calm for the benefit of the others. Jesus, of course, we've referred to this already today. He he stood up in the middle of a storm on a boat with the power to declare stillness. Do you remember Jesus commanded the wind and the waves to stop and they were still. And the storms of life that are created by our own waywardness, our own running from God, our own sins, that eventually without any check, And without any intervention, will lead to our spiritual death. The storms will literally eat us up. Our sin is forgiven. And the storm is calmed. By whom? By Jesus. Jesus, the one who sacrificed himself for us on the cross. And offers us peace with our maker. I encourage you today. If if you have not, if you're just understanding or who Jesus is or if you haven't made that response to him, then it's acknowledging that we've been running. It's turning back and, and, and accepting his offer of forgiveness. Jesus says, this is for you. Peace with God is available through Jesus, the cross and his rising In response, what did the sailors do? It says that they greatly feared the Lord. They made a sacrifice to him. They made vows to him. Definitely responded. It's hard to say. It's hard for us to say whether there was a true repentance and faith from them yet. And also at this stage, it's tricky to know quite what Jonah's response to God was, as in what his motives were in his heart. Yes, he recognized his sin and he he realized he needed to pay for them, but Where was he up to with God? There's quite a few twists and turns in the story yet. We'll come on to next week. This is a true story of transformation. And God's got a true story of transformation for each of us. And what is it that we need to respond to to God today? And what might he be wanting us to respond to him to over the coming weeks? Please don't let anything today have passed you by. (laughs) Uh, He's got something for each of us. So let's just pray. Let's just have a moment of silence, stillness, some stillness, and see what it is that God has said to us. Father, we thank you that um, this story is a story of all of us and for all of us. And it, it describes a running, but it also describes a God who won't leave us alone. But if we're listening to this today, then God is speaking to us. And I thank you that you do, and I thank you that you
love us so much that you won't let us run or wander. So whatever it is that you're saying to us, however you're speaking to us, Lord, please help us to respond by faith, by turning to Jesus, by recognising your mercy and seeing that your purpose for us is to bring peace and to bring calmness through our relationship with you that you have to offer us. So we praise you and we ask for a growing faith in each of us and that we might help each other to look to Jesus in our lives. Thank you. Praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.